I'm Doug Bobst, personal trainer, best-selling author, and entrepreneur, and I'm on a mission to help others become the best version of themselves. So I'd like to welcome you to the Adversity Advantage Podcast, where we will help you use obstacles, failures, and setbacks to give you that edge needed for success. I'll be interviewing people from all walks of life on how they overcame trials and turned them into triumphs. So please, sit back, relax, and get ready to be absolutely blown away by some of the wisdom and stories you're about to hear. Welcome back to another episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobes, where we help people use adversity to become their best self. And I have a very special guest today. Uh, Many of you know him as the CEO of Hollis Company, the husband to Rachel Hollis, the guy who crushed it at Disney for years and actually took a huge leap of faith to leave uh, to be a better dad, a better family man, and actually help his wife um, take their business to the next level. And I'm here with Dave Hollis, who is the author of of Get Out of Your Own Way, which is due out later this year, which by the way, if you haven't read this book yet, you need to because as a guy, it completely changed my perspective on relationships, on failure, on my ego, and I learned a lot and I I, I literally could not put it down. I read it in like two days, so you have to get the book. Um, But Dave, thank you so much for hopping on. Thank you, Doug, for having me. I am excited to be here. Thanks, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. I want to kind of, I mean... You know, a lot of people we probably, you know, on the on the show we've gone into their stories and everything. For me, I want to start with your book because I think a book will unpack a lot of your story anyway. Um, and you know, your book is set up very interestingly and actually, like I said, digestible. Where you got twenty different lies that have been told, and each one with their own backstory and the kind of kind of how to through your life. And the one I want to start with is is one that's very. Uh, it's very real men in emotion, right? Cause I think as guys, we're afraid to cry. We're afraid to show emotion. We're told that we're judged by how many women we sleep with, how good we are at sports and how much money we make. And it creates these massive insecurities and fears inside of us. So talk a bit, a bit about like your struggle with emotion as a male, how you kind of man navigated through that and kind of where you're at, where you are now and what advice you have for people trying to get through that, that part of life. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting. So many of the things that we have been downloaded software wise in our becoming the humans that we are are a reflection of the societal norms that our models grew up with, are a representation of the way that our fathers or mothers experienced their life. It's a lot of times through the lens of traditional definitions of masculinity or through the lens of uh, like what society says real men should do or how real guys, uh, you know, should behave that you are taught to be a man. And there are so many things inside of that that worked against truly being able to tap into who I really am, not who you think I should be, what society says I should be, the way that it feels when I actually have emotion but have to suppress it stinks. And for me, I, I was in the midst of this very interesting transition from being in my 30s to being in my 40s, asking a really bigger, broader set of questions about my purpose in this life and why I've been put on this planet and why I was gifted with the tools that I was gifted with. And in trying to do the work to understand why I felt so stuck, though there were so many things in my life that on the outside looked like the trappings of what someone who's successful or someone who has security or someone who is living into what it means to be a real man should have and be happy with, I was feeling underfulfilled. And the lies in this book, including this one, that real men don't have emotion or show emotion, uh, were things that I had to debunk to, as the book is called, get out of my own way. But in doing so, I was able to find a piece in understanding who I am and why Owning who I am, my struggle and my triumph, owning who I am, the way that I feel and think, owning who I am in in kind of every capacity, regardless of how that version of me compares to how my dad was as a man growing up or what society suggests that I should be as a person going from young to older man. Uh, Because when I have experienced the most pain in my life, It's the times when there's been the most dissonance between who I know myself to be and who I am showing up as to attempt to please other people. And that dissonance, that disconnect, that incongruence between who I know I really am, a person who is full of emotion, and who I was 
showing up as, as a leader inside of a big corporate environment, as the parent of four kids, as the husband to my wife, sometimes was more about living into the rules as dictated by other people's fear, rules as dictated by other people's wiring, the way that they just were lockstep marching to the beat of the way that society suggested that they ought to. And it was disconnected from who I am. And so it really, you know, like I start each chapter with the lie, but in this case, like, of course men have emotion. Of course we ought to represent those emotions when they come up. If you ask me like, Dave, what's one of the biggest problems facing the population today? There is a mental health crisis that exists in this country in almost every country. And in the cases when it applies to men, There's such a correlation between the taboo around talking about mental health, the taboo around talking about things that are not working well, the taboo around sharing, emoting, feeling things, which of course each of us are feeling because there is a universalism in the fact that we all feel things and there's a universalism in the fact that we all struggle. And when we train our boys to grow up in a society that says you can't feel or you shouldn't share your feelings, We're telling them to suppress something that might afford them the opportunity if they were to have shared it, the chance to get help, the chance to connect to other people to appreciate the shared experience of that struggle. And in that empathy, maybe find something that says, hey, you're going through this problem too? Fantastic. Let's get through it together. Yeah, and and you brought up a really good point of like if you don't express yourself, you'll never know if you get that any kind of opportunity where you could have had. And, you know, I know there'll probably be some people that'll push back and say, well, nobody cares. Nobody cares about your feelings. Nobody cares about my feelings. And I would argue, as you would, too, that, I mean, that's kind of not not true at all. People do care. People, when you're in a relationship, if you're suppressing your emotions and you're not sharing how you authentically feel, it can lead to, you know, drinking more, which we'll talk about here shortly. It can lead to depression, anxiety. How has like being able to express yourself, like for instance, more openly in your marriage, how has that improved your relationship with Rachel? Well, I mean, it goes back to what I just said in part in that I can't get help for the things that I'm struggling with if I'm not like really comfortable sitting in a posture of being an open book when it comes to what it is that's on my mind. Now, we've done something that, you know, is crazy and that in the last year and a half, we made a conscious choice to move our family, join forces, do work together inside of our business life that makes us spending time together a constant. So we are together all the time. And as a part of our decision to do that, we also had to change the way that we thought about constructive conflict as a requirement for success. And so... If I'm feeling something in our marriage, if I'm feeling something in our business partnership, we have too many things to do. We have too many employees depending on us to do them well. We have an audience that we're trying to put tools in the hands of that if we avoid dealing with the stuff that's sitting, even at the surface level, that's just gnawing at us a little bit, if we're not addressing in real time what those feelings are, they have the chance to fester. They have a chance to infect us in a way that like, just wouldn't afford us the opportunity to reach people in the way that we'd hope to. And it'll compromise our ability to show up well for each other because the work we're doing is it's hard. Yeah. And we have to be able to acknowledge the things that we are feeling. And when it's ego that's driving the frustration, when it's fear that's driving the frustration, when it's misunderstanding that's driving the frustration, the only way you can get to the bottom of what's really happening is by bringing it into the light, like having a conversation about it. So often, the times when things go sideways, we are resisting speaking about how we feel We are creating a hypothesis, this ridiculous version of events in our mind that is totally disconnected from the actual facts of what's happening in our life, that if only we had had the comfort, the comfort, the permission, the way of having a candid conversation in real time, we could have gotten to the bottom of the fact that, oh, nope, that's just our mind running wild, creating a story that doesn't serve us and is so disconnected from reality that if we just talked about it, we could have not wasted that emotion, not wasted that time, stayed on topic and been more effective in impact. Yeah, you're right. And those conversations are, are tough, right? And I know you talk a lot in your, about in your book, you know, getting comfortable, being uncomfortable, having that going from that fixed mindset to the growth mindset. 
and I think you know having when you're upset when you're uh, frustrated irritated being able to like manage those emotions and talking to your partner talking to a coworker and getting to the bottom of that point so that it doesn't fester and you end up having to reconcile a fight and not what you were originally talking about I think the better those kinds of relationships can be and I know like a, a real a turning point in your in your guys relationship was obviously when you were in Hawaii and you were kind of sitting drinking you didn't want to go out and I as somebody who's been in recovery for over 11 years I know the feeling of um having to use a substance to numb pain to numb emotion to numb feelings to get me through the day talk about a talk a bit about like how where you were at that point in your life like what you what was going through your mind because a lot of people even back then would have probably looked at you and be like what do you have to worry about like you're Dave Hollis like you got a great job you have a great family you're married to Rachel everything should be perfect right and we all know it's not true so talk talk about like where you were at that point um what was your relationship with alcohol and what was like the turning point that made you really want to change yeah. So I, you know, I had the blessing, the, I mean, unbelievable blessing of getting to work at the Walt Disney Company, greatest company on earth. I had a career that lasted uh, a little more than 17 years worth of time. In the last seven of those years, I was the head of the sales division of the movie studio. So I am selling movies to movie theaters. And when I first came into the job, I knew very little about what I was doing. I was drinking from a fire hydrant regularly. It was challenging. It was creating growth because of how discomfort, uncomfortable it was. And I was thriving because of just this massive challenge, a bigger than my resume called for kind of opportunity. And about two years in, just on the heel, I got the job just after they'd acquired Pixar. And two years in, there was an acquisition of Marvel Studios. Two more years in, there's an acquisition of Lucasfilm. And so now I am tasked with this awesome and uh, believe me, like unbelievable in so many ways opportunity to sell Star Wars and Avengers and Pixar and Disney and Disney animation movies to movie theaters. And man, movie theaters need those movies. So the challenge of that job at the beginning, that learning curve, after it was, you know, chipped away at, the strength of the team was so strong, the strength of these brands so strong, I found myself in an environment where it wasn't taking as much for me to achieve success. And in the absence of being pushed into a posture of growth, because of it not being challenging, I was dying, because you're either growing or you're dying. And so even though I had, optics-wise, this job that was uh, absolutely 100% one of the greatest jobs in Hollywood and got to work with some of the most creative people, had the greatest leadership team, I was struggling. And in that struggle, it was contrasted against my wife really stepping into and reaching for personal growth as one of the most important commodities in her life. She started going to development conferences. She's reading every book. She's you know listening to every podcast. And in the midst of this season, writes this book, Girl, Wash Your Face, which is her really tackling in an unbelievably transparent way all of these lies that she believed that kept her in her own way and how in debunking those lies, finding those truths, she could have a great life, have, have you know more access to fulfillment in, inside of herself. And, uh, and I, as I'm like descending into this trench of my own making and watching her ascension into this more elevated higher level of herself and that contrast is paralyzing me as I uh, am struggling to understand at the time why I'm stuck uh, uncomfortable skeptical of the kind of tools that would have helped me get out of my own way and in that pain have decided that my coping mechanism will be having a drink to round out the rough edges of the day right which you know like for anyone you start with something that feels innocent and totally manageable it's just a couple of drinks here a couple of drinks there and the story that i tell at the beginning of the book is man i've just been handed this book from my wife who's crushing all things in life where she's telling unbelievably honest stories of a bunch of stuff that frankly i think is too vulnerable too transparent and it acts as this catalyst for the casual relationship with alcohol to tip into something that's more about uh, over drinking and, and medicating with alcohol. And so we end up having this conversation when we come back from this vacation about what I'm going to do with the station I find myself stuck in in life. 
And it was a really painful conversation and a hard conversation. And she put it in very, very simple, clear terms. I am growing, Dave. I am going to continue to grow every single day. Growth is one of the most important things in my life. You are currently not growing, which was generous because I was the opposite of growing, was dying every single day. And if you continue on this path, this trajectory, and I continue on my path, my trajectory, in three months, will we still be going on dates? In a year, will we still be making out? In three years, will we still be married? And I knew very much in that real-time conversation, the answer to those questions and that leverage of knowing what the price of my inaction would be in not making drastic, real change to my life, I was walking toward sharing weekends with my kids, having a drinking problem that couldn't be fixed, being overweight, out of shape, shame-filled, and everything else. And so I had to make some very big decisions about how to change the way that I was doing my life. And a lot of the stories in the book, honestly, are in some ways connected to the decisions that came as the aftermath and the aftermath of, of that hard conversation where the leverage of what might happen if I didn't make change was the trail of breadcrumbs that led to a bunch of different, bigger, better questions on how to make your life better. And it's so interesting you bring you bring that up because um, I think it takes sometimes like you took as much as you don't want to say that you didn't have that growth mindset in a way you kind of did because you took action before it got too late. There's a lot of people that would have just stayed been been like, you know, I don't believe you, Rachel. I don't that's not going to happen. I'm going to stay this if you love me and just not would have done wouldn't have done anything. And you took that first step. And you stop because a lot of people, they wait for their marriage to completely fall apart in divorce or they wait for to lose that job. I mean, before like really stopping drinking. And I see a lot. I see a lot of problem with people who are successful alcoholics, right? They'll get home and they'll have two, three, four five glasses of wine. And then they think life's life's good because they're they're making money. And you've just proven that that's not the case. So I want to shift gears just a little bit into um, your faith. Um, because I know your faith for your family is is a very big priority. I know it's extremely important. And one part of your book that I really um, I have a lot of empathy for is the adoption process you went through several years ago in L.A. Or and, and I know how how tough it was and how you you know you lost a couple kids and then Noah came. Talk about the journey of the adoption process and how it really tested your faith and what faith means to you and how you use it in your daily life. Right on. You know, it's it's one of these interesting things. This concept of faith is a thing I thought I understood until I went through things that were harder than I thought I could handle that pushed us past the point of anything feeling like it was in our control. And, you know, I'm sure there are plenty of people listening that are like, yep, I got great strong faith and they have not yet been tested and they will find out what faith really means. And then I'm on the same at the other side of the coin. There are plenty of people that are like, yes, of course, faith is a thing that exists in my life, in part because of how it was co-piloting me through a season of unbelievable, unbelievable hard times. So we went into a conversation about wanting to have a daughter in our life after we'd had our three boys. And we started out on the path of international adoption that for a year and a half seemed like the path we were going to take. And then that didn't end up working out. They closed down the program. We were in Ethiopia as a part of an Ethiopian program. And um, there was some tough stuff that was happening with trafficking of humans inside of the country. So for good reason, they closed the program and we shifted gears. It was time to pivot, kept praying about it. What are we supposed to do? And the answer felt like it was, hey, there are there is need in your own backyard. We leapt into the county of Los Angeles and the foster to adopt program that existed in the county of L.A. because we were living there at the time. And we had two girls come into our life in the spring of 2016. We knew it was a short term placement, but the prerequisite for adopting was having uh, some kids in care for a limited amount of time. So we were there for them, loved them, interacted with their bio parents as they uh, redeemed themselves and went through their rehabilitation process. They got their kids back and it was a happy first chapter to our experience in foster care. And uh, we got a phone call about the adoptability, fast track adoptability of a pair of twins 
who had been born and abandoned in the hospital in LA. And we had a very short window of time to make a decision. We prayed about it, felt called into it, and made uh, what I thought at the time was the you know biggest choice in uncertainty uh, in walking into something that we did not know anything about, could not control. And we said yes to twins who happened to be drug addicted, who happened to be uh, as we were growing our family, they, they were they happen to be African American, so we we're introducing uh, having a mixed race family and and what it would mean to want to honor their heritage and 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 find a community that they could relate to. We were doing this with three boys, so thinking through the lens of how it might affect our boys, bringing two new humans into our life at one time, uh, and they're twins. I mean, twins are hard, and for eight weeks we had these twins and we loved on these twins, we named them, we stayed up through the night with them, weaned them off drugs, uh, had them you know, just as a part of our family and then got a phone call saying, hey, uh, it turns out these kids were not adoptable after all. And uh, it was heartbreak, heartbreaking and such a like massive rug pull. And in the, the abyss, the, like, the aftermath of that unbelievably difficult phone call and a white van that came to just, you know, humanlessly pick them up, uh, we were sitting in our backyard, arms in the air, like, God, why have you led us into this journey to leave us here? I mean, like, truly, it was a test of our faith in this belief that there was a reason why this was happening, because it was so hard in that moment to see it. Well, fast forward to a decision that we made to transition into private adoption. We met a biological mother who was interested in having us uh, raise the child she was going to give birth to. We met her. We're in the hospital room when she, when our daughter was born. And, and now I have an almost three-year-old daughter who is the answer to so many of the, you know, arms in the air questions. Hel that she's just, hilarious, by the way. Oh my God. I, 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 I like wait to watch your stories and your tea time with Noah because I just, it's just, it's, it's the funniest thing I've ever, and I, I love comedy and it's like funnier than comedy. It's funny. Go on. Now, well, <laughs> thank you. She is hilarious. She's a monster. She's amazing in, in all ways. Um, but I can look back now on that season with such gratitude because in part, we were able to be in the lives of these two girls who we thought were ours but never were for the time that they needed us to be there. And the lesson of what it would mean for us to grow in intentionally choosing the uncertainty of foster care fundamentally rewired the way that I think and will forever think about the importance of walking towards uncertainty because of its opportunity to afford you growth. We live now in Austin, Texas. I left the Walt Disney Company. We are pursuing the work that we pursue today in so many parts of this business that we do not yet totally and fully understand that scare the pragmatist in me to death because of the fruit that came out of that uncertain season. And that to me is like the faithfulness of a God who was all along walking us into a journey so that Yep, we could be light in a dark space, in a broken foster care system for girls who needed us when they did, and also so that we would come out the other side thinking differently about how important it is to pursue the discomfort of the journey, the like embracing the struggle, honoring it. I mean, it's interesting because it, in, this, in this case, it, it actually ties a little bit into the drinking conversation, just if you'll indulge me for two seconds. Like, one of the things that I had to come to terms with when it came to drinking as a mechanism to mute the anxiety or the fear of taking this risk and moving our family, taking this risk and leaving the Walt Disney Company for this thing we're building ourselves. I'd always had alcohol as something that would help calm me down. And what it was calming was yes, me, but it was also taking the benefit of growth and eliminating it. Because instead of experiencing the discomfort of the uncertainty, instead of experiencing the discomfort of identity challenges or challenging what masculinity means or challenging how to work well with your partner, I was muting all of those feelings and I got none, none of the benefit. So here I'd made this big declaration that I was ready. I've got this tattoo, a ship in 
harbor is safe, but that is not what ships are built for. I decided, right, I'm this ship, I'm going to leave the harbor. But then instead of actually enjoying the benefit of the waves as they crash against the boat to make me a more skilled sailor, I was calming the waters with alcohol in a way that never actually built any kind of resiliency or new skills or, you know, any of the things that, frankly, I said I was in pursuit of when I was leaving something that didn't uh, afford me the kind of growth that I'm looking for to be fulfilled. So did ego play a role in that as far as like you leaving Disney and then having to take this leap of faith of being the breadwinner, being the guy who's like head of Disney or head of sales for Disney? I got this kick butt job and now you're going to help your wife who is you know made a name for herself and built building something spectacular did your ego like get in the way at all is that did that play a role in your drinking of course i mean here's the thing ego gets in the way every day i haven't you know like i've not been drinking for a quite a long time now and congratulations uh, still, on that by the way thank you i appreciate that I feel great but it's like Ego, ego is at the root of so many of the things that get in our way and the clarity in seeing it doesn't change the fact that it still comes up, you know, I mean, like, the, I think back to making this decision and so many of the things in this decision were attached to the worry or wonder of what other people in my circle would think of a choice that made sense to me, but not them. And you know, in a in a in a world where I needed to leave what I knew for what I needed, the fact that I didn't leave earlier was so connected to what they would think because of my ego being insecure about their reaction to my choice. And here's the gift: no one, no one was actually thinking about what I was doing. They inevitably were always thinking about themselves because. They're not terrible human beings. They're not monsters. They're just human. And we as human beings are thinking first and foremost about ourselves because of ego, right? The same thing that was driving my choice to stay stuck, not wanting to be embarrassed, not to have you know people questioning my sanity, not to have them worried about what I was doing, was the thing that actually was protecting me from their judgment in the first place because they were primarily interested in what was going to be the effect of me leaving on them, not on me, right? And so uh, ego in today's world shows up in a completely different way, right? Like I'm unbelievably less affected by the opinions of other people. I've written this book now that has shared way more things than most normal human beings will ever share. There is freedom in that. Those things are not things that my insecurities or shame can hold me back by because I've now just spoken them into light. I get to own them. I'm proud of having survived them. I have a completely different mindset because of them. But ego still, as we're, my wife and I, trying to figure out how to work well together and still make out, ego as it pertains to what it might mean as a man in a relationship with a woman who is unbelievably more successful in yeah. terms of financial. I was going to ask, like, is, did that, like being quote unquote in the shadow of Rachel Hollis, did that, pour, you know, feed into your insecurities at all when you left Disney, I'm sure a little bit? It, it, I mean, the thing is, we made a decision to do this before Girl Wash Your Face came out. We moved just after it did. So we had a, we had like a, I'd read the book. I had a sense of what was coming. We like believed in the mission, believed in our ability to do this work and had zero concept, zero concept of what the last two years has actually meant in our life. It has been the absolute best two years and it has been the absolute hardest two years <laughs> because, right, like, navigating, uh, you know, her books unbelievably have sold more than 4 million copies in this last two years. That is something that five people on this planet maybe can say about their books in the last two years. The, the, the magnitude of what that means to how we can grow this team and what it might mean in terms of our identities shifting, right? I played the role of being the primary breadwinner in our family, in our marriage, for 12, 13 years, and now that it's switched, it's just something that 
I have to ask a better set of questions about when I get triggered by the worry of what it might say about me being worthy or enough or good or a real man, because most of those things, again, aren't actually real. And so I've had to stay connected to therapy. I've had to stay connected to a circle of other human beings who are on a completely different level when it comes to their mindset and the way they appreciate what actually matters versus the lies we tell ourselves in the privacy of our own head. And it's also just constant work. It's not like, you know, oh, I've figured it out and now everything's fantastic. I had to substitute drinking with running. And running has been an unbelievable outlet for processing the things I'm thinking, whether it's breadwinning or anything else. Now, just because I've found a healthier coping mechanism doesn't mean that the stresses or the triggers have gone away. I've run 800 miles in the last year. Like I am running on the roads a lot, <laughs> but that's a version of therapy and church and peace and connecting with nature and seeing God and like a whole host of things that is way healthier, but also in that healthiness allows me to process these things so that I can keep showing up well for myself and, and my wife and, and this community. And it's funny you, you talk about running. I know you're, you're a huge runner and you've obviously made a ton of progress. I mean, just from following you the last few months, just seeing how your, your times have gone down, how your mileage has gone up. I know for me, when I was in jail, having to process a lot of what, what happened, and we talked about this on your show, was running helped me ease my mind. It was like a, a moving meditation for me. And, you know, you're right. People ask all the time, like, oh, you're, you're not using alcohol. You're not using drugs. Like, you guys are successful. Like, does that mean like, no stress, right? And it's like, no, like, more money, more problems, right? And you got a family. <laughs> you got four kids. You got a company. You got a ton of employees. It's just the way you manage it now is different. It's like you go for a run now when, you, when you, maybe you have to fire an employee you didn't want to fire. You go, you know, lift some weights when maybe after you and Rachel get into some sort of argument you didn't want to. And it's just different. And, you know, I think the more people can embrace how they manage stress and, and cope with those, with those types of situations, the more open they'll be to sharing about their struggles because they'll know that they're managing it in different ways. And they won't be ashamed of the fact they're having to drink a bottle of wine a night. Um, I, I, I went through a really interesting exercise right around the new year that has been so helpful in me having clarity on the kind of the price of entry, the, the prerequisites, if you will, for the life I say I want to have. Like my brain is very like I'm I'm the pragmatist. I'm way more practical in my thinking, and so using the math equation if then has been a thing I just keep coming back to over the last handful of months. And that is, if I can go back to what I said earlier, that the times in my life where the dissonance, this disconnection between who I say I want to be and who I know myself to be when I'm falling asleep at night in my own head is separated. There's distance, there's dissonance between the two, then how can I create alignment? What uh, Creating alignment ends up being a goal for me. I want to align who I tell you I am, who I say I want to be, and who I actually am as one single thing. And so I've had to go through the exercise of, okay, who do I really want to be in relationship with my wife? I want to have an exceptional relationship. I want one where we pursue each other every single day. Okay, so if I want to have that kind of relationship, then I need to do these things. My calendar has to reflect that. My actions, the tone of my voice, the way that I uh, acknowledge and, and show up for her, knowing what her love language is and the way that she can receive love. Uh, like, I want to be an exceptional model for my children. Okay. Like, I, I, what I write down every single day is that I want to be close to my children. Okay. So, if I want to be close to my children, then I need to do some very specific things every single day. I got to put my phone down. I got to ask them open-ended questions. I need to take interest in the things that they have interest in. I need to maybe learn what they're watching on TikTok or the vernacular of their video games so that I can connect with them in a way that allows us to have a deeper conversation into something that's more real and more meaningful. If I want to do work that allows me the energy to jump up and down on stages. I'm getting ready to go on a 20 plus city book tour. Then I have to have a morning routine, a, 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 just a commitment to fitness and a, an eating program and, and drinking all the water program that 
actually affords me the energy to serve these audiences as well. So I, I take it from if then. And the reality is there are going to be things when you actually go through that exercise where you're like, I don't want to do that work. Okay, then that is fine. If you say, you know what, I really want to be able to watch two hours of streamed content on Netflix every night. That's awesome. I will not judge you. But then you might have to change your then statement, because if that's something that you want, then you have to decide that you are not going to pursue every single one of your goals. You're not going to show up as well as you might like for the relationship that you say you're interested in having exceptional. There are just connections and consequences to your actions, both positive consequences and negative consequences. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I always say that the difference between what you want, um, the more you can narrow the gap between what you want and the more you do, like the happier you'll be, right? Because it all comes down to action. And so many people, they want to change their habits. They want to change their mindset. They want to, but they don't do anything about it. They just kind of talk about it. And and goals are important. Having five-year, 10-year, 15-year goals, yeah, we all know they're important. But doing the things every single day, like you said, like no one sets these goals without doing the stuff every single day. They don't. They they're not in, they're not you know non intentional with their day, but yet intentional with a ten year plan. So I think it's really important that you said that. And then you know I've been to your conference. I went to your to your Rise Business Conference. By the way, anybody who's looking to change um, their their game, their mindset, their energy. I mean, I was in a little bit of a rut, and coming to that, just seeing some of the amazing speakers that y'all had, including yourself and Rachel, it was it was phenomenal. And I gotta admit, I was a little insecure when I went because I was like, ah, oh, there's gonna be like ninety five percent like women there, you know. I'm like, how am I gonna fit, you know? And I went by myself, and but I went because obviously, I, you know, I wanted to, to say hello to you and and see Tom and and some of the other speakers that were there, and. I, so you go to that and you people, I mean, if there was thousands of people there, they're probably leaving there thinking that you and Rachel in the last six months to a year, you know, you don't experience hardships or times where you've had to really like have your faith tested again. Like what kind of, what's one thing that might stick out in the last six months that has been a turning point that, you know, you had, you guys had to walk through together that somebody might not know. Well, it's, you know, there's no such thing as balance. I, I like talk about it in the book. You know, I'm all about being centered and not, uh, you know, deluding ourselves with the possibility that you can just uh, proclaim that balance is a thing that you're interested. In. There are days we have to run at a 10 on the treadmill and days that you can run at a one on those one days. Go see your kids performing, performing, you know, in auditorium four at 1140 a.m. Uh, on the days where there's a 10, you're going to probably have to sacrifice some of the things that you'd like. But the schedule for sure in this last year has been a challenge that I don't know we could have totally got our heads wrapped around. Uh, Rachel spoke on 60 stages last year, had a book come out, launched a line at Target and had a line come out at QVC. Like we we just uh, we bit off a lot of things. And man, it sounds like, oh, wow, high class problems. You had a bunch of things happening. But um, the any of those things happening as much as they were successful and we enjoyed the way that they were received and used by the community to help them take control of their life, help them do the things to actually activate exceptional excellence inside of their life. Um, they're, they're still taxing. It's still, it's still hard. So we're trying right against the backdrop of a company that in a year went from six to 64 employees in a year that went from having a couple of conferences to having eight conferences and a year that went you know, from a single product line to a second product line, we're still interested in having this exceptional marriage. We're still parenting four kids, which is like a thousand kids. And we're doing it while we're juggling uh, what it might mean to be on the road a little bit more or you know, having to have you know, a little more of a commitment to third party, outside party. So we're still, we're still kind of finding our, our footing in how we Create, create the kind of calendar that is a reflection of our personal values as much as our professional values and how we stay consistent with the things, right? Thursday night, tomorrow night for us, date night, every single night. It's a non-negotiable, even on the nights that we don't like each other. We always love each other. We're going on a dang date on a Thursday night. Every single morning, like getting up and having the morning routine that we have, it's a non-negotiable. So what, what's, the, your mor what's your morning routine kind of look like? I mean... My my morning routine, we're up at five every morning. Rachel's writing right now. So during her writing window, she actually gets up a little bit before that. She's up right now like four, four fifteen, writing for a good hour. 
Then I'm up around five. Uh, I'm in the gym from 5.30 to 6.30. She's in the gym from 6.30 to 7.30. We alternate days uh, so that, you know, one of us is taking, uh, getting the kids up, getting them, into, getting them out to school. After we drop them off for school, we're having a quick breakfast. I mean, we're very, like, routine. So, like, she's having two eggs. I'm having four. I'm having a cup of oatmeal. She's having three-quarters cup. There's a few berries. On, I mean, like, yeah. it's a kind of similar thing every time. And then we do our very bizarre but fun morning show every single morning. And then we start our day. And we've started now doing the morning show here at the office because it's a, just an easier way to transition right into the work of the day. And every single day is completely different, right? Like uh, one day I'm having meetings about people and the next day I'm having meetings about you know contracts and deals. Um, but we're trying to figure out how to do all of it. We get home, you know, most nights we're still sitting down at a dinner table having dinner with every single human in our family. Most nights we're, you know, able to put the kiddos to bed and uh, spend some time together before we fall asleep at night. And, um, you know, it's like, is there chaos at all times? Of course. Is there like an ability in the routines that we have or the habits that we have to minimize the impact of that chaos? Absolutely. Yeah, you're right. I was just going to say like, yeah, I mean, it's chaos, it's struggle, it's stress. But through all that, you've you've built this foundation of how you guys kind of navigate that together. So we've kind of talked about, you know, we've obviously talked a lot about your business, um, the struggles. Let's talk about some more fun things. I know one of your biggest hobbies is running. And I've obviously, um, I think Rachel made a joke at the conference and I read in your book about, you know, fantasy sports and baseball and everything or some of your other hobbies. Do you still do fantasy baseball and play video games? Like, what are some other things you like to do for fun besides run? I am a, a fantasy sports dork. I mean, like, I I'm in too many leagues every single season for basically every sport. I just got a trade offer, a four way team trade offer, which I don't even understand is possible <laughs> in a basketball league I'm in, and I'm being dangled Zion, who's coming off the injured reserve here shortly. Anyway, it doesn't matter. No, no, yeah. <laughs> I am. I'm. I, I love. I love it because there's an energy and a and a camaraderie in that community of people who are talking trash as much as they are like encouraging. I've been in a, a few of the leagues for two decades now. So we started these leagues when we were idiots and in some instances not married and in most instances without kids. And now we're sharing pictures of what's happening in each other's families as much as we're giving each other grief about how the point guard on my team fails to shoot three pointers well. So um, that I'm definitely into. I have a, I have a Bronco, a 1969 Ford Bronco that I love to take out. I, I live now in Hill Country outside of Austin, Texas, and there are a lot of just open spaces to take a big height. It, it's all t it's a tall bronco it makes a massive amount of noise it is not the most comfortable ride but dang it it's fun to drive around in the dirt uh I, but yeah, I mean like video video games not as much I'll be honest because video games in a weird way were kind of a companion to drinking it was about uh finding something that I could completely disengage myself from my problems with or disengage from the relationships that were creating strain. And so while I will play every once in a while, it's more often me jumping into and being killed immediately in a Fortnite battle with one of my kids than it is me getting lost in a baseball video game that would have previously been more about saying goodbye to my reality. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a fantasy. I love. I play fantasy football, and uh, I got. I mean, I'm, a, I'm in Baltimore. I'm a huge Ravens fan, so I'm obviously a little bummed that, that Lamar, uh, and the, the team. Like, gosh, it was it was heartbreaking to watch. It really was. I had Lamar. On, I had Lamar on the one. The team that went the furthest for me. I had four. I was in four leagues. Have been in these four leagues for a long time. And the team that got me to the finals was the Lamar Jackson. League. So that guy single handedly was a like a Madden cheat code kind of like winner every single week. Yeah. I mean, in Baltimore, I, I, they, they, they put so much pressure on that kid. He's 22 years old. They put so much pressure on him in the city, but he took this, he took the city of Baltimore, which I mean, I don't know if you know, is like known for like being one of the most, the highest murder rate in the country and, and brought something super positive to our, to our city, which is, which is amazing. I want to talk Disney for a minute. I want to know if you were the head of sales, 
what was one movie that should have sold way more and been more popular that didn't, in your opinion, that you really liked? Oh, man. That's a hard – I mean, like, most of like, – the, the place my, my mind goes to immediately are, like – the stories that everyone absolutely should have like themselves know, like usually like the real life, the true life stories. So like we had uh, a movie called Million Dollar Arm. We had a movie called McFarlane, right? Million Dollar Arm was about this guy who gets like picked up as a pitching prospect at a like radar throwing contest and ends up like it, it's a, it's a, it, but it's a true life story. Uh, the McFarlane was the story of these kids who were in cross country in a Bakersfield high school who end up becoming state champions, right? Like these movies that are based on real life heroes, especially around sports, because I'm a sucker for sports, they were so hard to sell. It was hard to like, you know, they, they had a smaller production budget and they had a harder time, you know, maybe transitioning into the like broad mass appeal. They're not, those aren't even movies that most people probably know about, but man, like sitting in the audience watching it, sobbing about runners in Bakersfield. I don't know. There was something in those. I, I love those. Like the like the rookie or remember the Titans kind of movies to me are like the ones I, I'm a sucker for. Yeah, the rookie and remember the Titans are two of my favorite movies of all time, especially remember the Titans. I mean, if I'm ever like looking to get like fired up, I'll go watch like, you know, just like 10 minutes of that movie. Denzel get you going. Oh, man. <laughs> like any of his movies. And it's funny because when you think of Disney, everyone's like, you know, Toy Story and The Lion King and now Star Wars. But they don't think about like the ones that kind of fell through the cracks that, you know, that that could have been better had like the audience, I guess, have, you know, clinged on to it the way. Because, I mean, now we're just getting the whole personal de- – those movies might have been more popular now that personal development, self-development is on the rise. You just never know. Um, so what's kind of next for the Hollis company? I know you guys are, are growing like crazy. You got a, you got a race coming up next year. You got more conferences. You're coaching now. Like talk a b- bit more about what you're doing with that and, and where the Hollis company's going. Yeah. I mean, I'm excited this year for me is a big year on just like the, like, what am I doing? Because this book of mine comes out here on, on March 10th. So dang it. I'm excited about that. I'm going to do a like, I don't know if it's 22, 20, whatever it is. It's like 20 or so cities of, a book tour. So that's exciting because I'm going to actually be able to come and see people and talk and, and, you know, get them excited, not just about the book, but hopefully uh, about getting out of their own way. Uh, and then I'm doing this coaching right now, which I am super, super fired up. Rachel did uh, her version of digital education online coaching last year in a life course and a business course, and I'm taking the reins. So I've got uh, a life course, like, Topics like fear, identity, practical stuff on like how to handle personal finances or what you might do to have an exceptional relationship. And then I'm doing a career course. So having spent 25 years inside of entertainment, talking a little bit about as a person who started at 20th Century Fox, who worked at a talent agency, who did grassroots marketing, spent 17 years then and the Walt Disney Company going from coordinator to president. What were some of the tips and tricks to building a career inside of an industry? And so I'm super fired up about that. And on the company side, it's like there's there's too many things. There's so many things. It's, uh, you know, we're running towards uh, another set of conferences. We've got a conference in Toronto, uh, the women's conference in Toronto, in San Diego, in London, and some we haven't yet announced. We've got our business conference, the one that you attended, that'll come this fall. You mentioned the run. We've got a a 5K half marathon that'll happen here in Austin, Texas in December. Uh, Rachel's just launched a new line of product at Target around planners and journals, calendars, uh, you know, inside the, the paper goods space, for lack of a better word. We've got an app that'll come out this year that's all about moving your body. We're really big on like a move your body, change your mind as a as an idea. And so uh, this app helps people hopefully focus on gratitude, track their water, have some motivation, inspiration, but then also and, and maybe most importantly, a bunch of content around body movement, whether it's going on a run with me, going on a hike with Trent Shelton, getting in the gym and moving your body with Rachel and our friend Chris. Um, we've got that launching here not terribly long from now. So we got a whole host of things. I'm excited. If people are interested, we have a website. It's thehollisco.com. You can check it out. we got 
every single thing you could want to know about what we're working on and the tools that we think if you were to apply them to your life would help you achieve your greatness. Um, it's all there at theholosco.com. Yeah, I got to get my butt up being able to run a half marathon because that's something I, that's on my list to do is to come out there and do that. You know, awesome. And what I like about your company is that I think the reason that so many people follow it and have, have so quickly is because you've created a movement. You've created, like, you see the Hollis Co. like emblem and you know that it's authentic. You know they're going to bring a lot of value, a lot of fun versus, like, I mean, because there's so many people on Instagram and on Facebook that are, like, the snake oil salesmen. They just want to sell you a program. But people buy your programs as a result of who what you have built already. It's not like they're buying your program just to buy a program. They're buying it because they believe in Dave Hollis. They're buying it because they believe in, Dave, in Rachel. They, they're buying it because they believe in your employees dancing on stage at your conferences, right? That's what they're buying. They're not buying, yeah. like, the, the, the coaching course itself. Um, so the last question I ask everybody is – just take Noah for example. Imagine you're on like tea time with Noah, and Noah is like, "Daddy, I'm really struggling right now. I'm really struggling to find myself. You know, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I'm my faith is kind of falling to the wayside, and I I don't know. Like, I don't. I'm not so sure what I'm going to do in five years. What kind of advice would you, What would you say to her, and why? Well, I mean. I am having a conversation with her regularly on this tea time because I want to try and preempt the possibility that she could question that she is worthy and enough and loved as she is today, period. I mean, Rachel wrote this book, Girl, Stop Apologizing. My hope with this woman that we are creating in our two-year-old, almost three-year-old daughter is that she will never, ever have the impulse or instinct to apologize for who she is because she was created by our creator to embody exactly what, you know, who she is. I, like I, I would just go back to a reminder that she was made perfectly, that she is someone who can and will contribute to this world, that there is light that she uniquely possesses that this world needs, and that she has to be uh, a person who can kind of push back against the voices that would otherwise have her mute this amazing person that she is, you know, the, 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 the root of most of the things that get in our way is fear and fear. It, it comes from a whole host of places, whether it's fear of the unknown or the judgment of other people, fear of failure, but all of that fear, uh, it lives inside of the dark. And so when you're able to speak it into the light and have a conversation about why it exists, then you got a chance at actually making it go away. Um, I hope with my kids, I hope in our relationship, and I hope, frankly, for anyone who's listening, when you experience the, the normal, traditional human impulses of insecurity, of wondering if you're enough, if wondering you're worthy, if wondering you're qualified, if wondering that you've got what it takes, that you will find someone who you can have a conversation with, so that in bringing it to the light, you can be affirmed in your worthiness today, just as you are, in your enoughness today, just as you are. You are on this planet to do great things. You've uniquely been given a set of experiences, and the story of those experiences are something that if you were willing to share and tell them, would afford someone the chance to see themselves in your story and believe that they too can persevere past their struggle because of the absolute universal nature of every one of us having struggle in our life. So. Don't hide it. Just be comfortable owning it and in owning it, be proud of how strong you are for having overcome the things that you've overcome. Own it, be proud of it and get out of your own way, man. Like Noah's super lucky to have a dad like you and it's it, you, you hit something that's really important when I asked the question was that you're doing the things now so that that question might not have to ever really be asked because you're very proactive and with your parenting and with your relationship and your business that you know a lot of people aren't proactive they wait for that day like I was saying earlier they wait for that divorce to come they wait for that job to be lost they wait for that addiction to come before making a change and um, you know I'm, I'm honestly really proud of what you've what you've accomplished just listening to your story I mean. And where can more people find out more about Dave Hollis himself if they want to you know, learn more about the book, the coaching? Is it all at the Hollis Co. website? Yeah, everything's on the HollisCo.com. If you want to follow me, I'm Mr. Dave Hollis on uh, Instagram and Dave Hollis there on Facebook. Uh, I, I, we do a lot of live content. We have a podcast called Rise Together that, yep, Doug's been on. So you're welcome to listen to that on Thursdays. But um, and every morning we get together and do this weird thing called the Start Today Morning Show that you are absolutely welcome. This is a community of people that 
think differently, vote differently, love differently, but in those differences, we find commonality in our interest in having a made for more kind of approach to life. And, uh, you know, everyone, every one of you who's listening, you're welcome to sit with us here in this community. Uh, and by the way, I, I want to say this too. If you end up going to the Hollis Co., if you end up going anywhere, then you see that there are tools and they just don't feel like they're for you. I, I, I am interested most in you applying tools to your life to help you stay out of your own way. So it might not be my book. It might not be our coaching. It might not be the conferences where we're jumping up and down and yelling it. But find the personal development conference, find the podcast, find the books, find the coaches, the community, the circle that's going to help you. It may not be us. It may not be Doug, frankly, but it is something that you need in your life if you are going to have the kind of life that you say you want to have. So well said from the man himself, Dave Hollis. What a story from, you know, just doing everything you did at Disney to where you are now and the struggles and how open and honest you are as a guy, which is really tough to do. Um, it's a true test of your masculinity, masculinity, your integrity, and you know, swallowing your pride to help make a difference in others. So I think people are really going to get a lot out of this episode, and I, I appreciate you hopping on. Right on, Doug. Thanks for having me, buddy. We'll talk to you soon. Hopefully see you at that starting line in Austin in December, brother. Thanks, man. And um, once again, you've listening to this episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bopes, and we will see you next time.